Amen. So we've been talking about a series called uh, The Truth About. So what I want to do is I want to take you, because yesterday was such a, a wonderful day. I slept all day because I was just not feeling good. But uh, so I want to take you from where we've left you into the next step for the next series that we're going to go. How many know that the Bible says in Ephesians 6, having done all to stand, what does it say? Stand, right? Amen. We talked about how important it was for us to sit down with Christ, get instructions from him every day, and then walk through our day with the goodness of God, say amen. And then we walk with God, we stand up in God, and we make a stand. So how many here had advanced since God's been in your life, you have grown and advanced? Put your hands up, it's okay. That means we're not going to back off. We're going to keep advancing. Can you say amen? Now in football, they taught us if you're going to get tackled, you fall forward. Amen. Did you guys want to go to Sunday school? You do? Where's our Sunday school person? Huh? There's three right there? Oh, okay. All righty. Wish you would have told me ahead of time, so I'm not on the tape. Oh. <laughs> anyway, so having done all to stand, we stand therefore, right? And it says, praying always with all kinds of prayer. All right, open your Bibles, please, to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start with verse 1. And it tells us that God wants us to stand. So let me share this with you. Jesus Christ went to hell and came back to give us salvation. And as many as accept him, the salvation that Jesus got was given to us and we become more than conquerors. Can you say amen? And the Bible says, having done all to stand, we stand, right? And we don't go backwards. So I got to emphasize this over and over again. So verse 1 says in Galatians 5, stand therefore, stand fast therefore in the liberty. How many here set free? So stand in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. In other words, you've been set free. Don't go back into the world. Don't go back into getting yourself all bound up again because Jesus set you free. Can you say amen? And it says to having done all to stand, you stand. So stand there, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ set you free. Now drop down to verse 15, uh, 13, please. Galatians 5, verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an occasion or opportunity to the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For all that's in the law, remember the law was designed to teach us that we can't save ourselves. For all that's in the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed one of another. Good wisdom, right? Let's drop down to verse 16. So he says, this I say then, walk in the spirit. Now, how many here know that we are two people? We're an old person. We're in the flesh and we're new people in the spirit. You get up every morning with your old guy, and then you have to go to God and lay him out on the altar. Amen? So that you can take God, and God can fill you for your day, that you can have expression, that you can give forth encouraging words. You can build up other people that need to be built up. You can pray and intercede. Amen? He says, this I say, walk in the Spirit. So... The spirit man is the real you. And when you walk in the spirit, you're walking from your heart out. So instead of walking through life in the flesh and take whatever comes your way, you get and you present your body a living sacrifice. You lay it on the altar. Let God zap it. 
let God fill you, then you get up and then you head on. So this is how you fulfill this. This I say, walk in the spirit. Walk from the spirit man, okay? That you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to another, so you do not do the things that you wish. How many ever found yourself struggling? Don't raise your hand. It's because we don't lay our body down like God zap it. If we forget to do something like that, oh, you'll, you'll think, oh, man, it's, it's okay. I'll just, I'll just go and I'll just make up for it later. And yeah, you can. But when you need to realize that once you've got your momentum going, once you're headed towards God, you don't want to uh, fall back in any kind of situation. Can you say amen? And the devil's really not that strong to cause you to fall. You have Almighty God living in you. You have Almighty God living around you. He's for you. He's with you. You have the name. You have the blood. You have the angels. You have the covenant. You have his word. <clears throat> so we are victorious people going somewhere to spread joy, liberty, and victory. And here's what happens to us. I'm going to just talk. Once we get a few victories, there's this tendency of us being, uh, what do we say, take our vacation. Oh man, God put that together and he did that and everything. And then we, we decide we're going to bless ourselves. Let me tell you something. It's okay to bless yourself, but not at the expense of Keeping yourself away from God. So here's what I found myself doing when I was very young. I'd get some victories. Oh, Lord, thank you very much. And then I'd sit back on those victories and I wouldn't do anything else. And listen, you're like an airplane. An airplane has momentum. It goes down the runway. And as soon as it reaches a, 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 the speed of lift, lift catches it and they move it some, and it begins to fly. Well, we are that creature that's flying. And if you shut off the engine, you're only going to glide so long. And that's what happens. Oftentimes, we get a few victories. We think we just can go ahead and do all this. We take things for granted. And next thing you know, the engine shuts off and we start to head towards the ground. And to avoid that, meet with God every day. I'm trying to teach you a preventative Christianity and not, well, you should have done that. And you better not do this. No, I want to give you a preventative Christianity whereby if you just apply it, God will give you all that he says in his word that he will give you and bring it to pass in your life. The key is, do you want to do what is required to meet with God, to walk in the spirit? So it says, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the, the crabby, rat faced fleshy type of person that wants to go do its own thing you know when somebody brings up an argument the flesh wants to argue but your spirit just simply wants to have peace can you say amen so you have the right to choose every day if you choose to walk in the spirit enjoy the fullness of your day or to walk out in the flesh. And how many know that we can't really serve God in the physical realm because we lack energy. We have to go to God, get his power, get his spirit so that he can fill us and moment us through the day. Say amen. So he says this, I say, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now drop down to verse 22. Tells us what that is. Got to take a drink of water here. Good to see you, brother. All right. Verse 22, Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is. Notice it didn't say fruits of the Spirit are. It says the fruit of the Spirit is. Love, joy, peace, Hello, amen, goodness, kindness, long-suffering, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Everyone say, there is no law. 
What was the law designed to do? To tell you that you are a sinner, that you need a savior. That's all the law was written for. To tell the Jewish nation, you really need to have the savior. The problem was when the savior showed up, when Jesus walked up, they crucified him. What a messed up world. You might say, well, wasn't that the plan? Yes. Jesus came to be the last sacrifice and to set a trap for the enemy. Did you know every morning when you get up and you seek God, you are a trap for the enemy? God makes you a trap for the enemy because when he tries to do things to you, you can just laugh and you can just rebuke him. You can just have a great time in the Lord. Why? Because he's trying to tempt you. He's trying to get you to fall. But thank God you listen to God. You walk in the spirit. You do not fulfill the lusts of your flesh. You don't argue because arguing is fleshly. You don't get angry because angry is fleshly. Well, what about that scripture that says, be angry and sin not? I don't know a human being that can do it. I know Jesus could. Things do anger us, but it's when we step out and we let them out and we start speaking silly things, that's when we really get into trouble. Someone say, oh, me. So again, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Listen, if you're a Christian, one of the things that should be predominant in your life is God's love. Amen? Love and forgiveness and goodness and kindness and gentleness. Amen? Long-suffering. Folks, the long-suffering there isn't for you. Long-suffering is for you to be patient with others. Don't smile at me that. <laughs> we have to be patient with others. Can you say amen? All right, so let's move on down. Now we're going to go and we're going to see what the law could not do. Briefly, we're going to go to Romans 7. If you would like to take your Bible to Romans 7. We're going to look at Paul. Paul was one of the highest trained Pharisees that you could ever train. He trained under a guy named Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was one of the greatest teachers that existed in the Jewish synagogue. So Paul went to school and learned to be from the best. Trouble is, he learned all the wrong things. You see, the law is very frustrating. It's perfect, but the law is very frustrating because when you do something good, you line it up with the law and the law says it's not good enough. Whoa. Now, God isn't that way. He accepts you totally through his son. But we cannot do anything by the law. And so that really answers the question, what about all these people that are going back under the law and they're doing the Jewish thing and they're going wild like that? They a little bit, that's a little bit fallen from grace, I would say. They seem happy in doing all that, but the law does not save anybody. And the practice of the law can't save anybody. It's the practice of our faith towards God in Jesus Christ that saves us. Can you say amen? All right, so look at Romans 7. This is Paul saying, after all my schooling, after all my life, being a student of the law, being one that believed in the Judaism of my fathers, even at the persecution of Christians and possibly at their death. Remember, it says the code of Stephen was laid at the feet of Saul, part of Tarsus. Okay. Listen to what he said. In verse 21 in Romans 7, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I desire, or excuse me, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. See, Paul wanted to do good, but he found himself not doing good. And that his inner man wanted to obey the law. I mean, after all, who wants to steal? Who wants to cheat? Who wants to commit false, false witness? That's what the law says. Thou shall not. Thou shall not. Thou shall not have any other gods before him. We all fail. If you polish your truck one too many times. Not really. Because things that are created always fall second to the creator. Can you say amen? 
And we really don't want to put things that are created in front of our Creator. So he goes on and he says, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward one. But verse 23 says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Then he says, this is, he's talking about himself. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now, do you see it? That you have to lay your body down and let God zap it? Because your flesh has a curse in it. And if you don't do that, it will work against you. It, it will lay down and want to be sick. It will, will lay in bed an extra hour. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God, he says, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Everyone say amen. amen. So then, with my mind, I may think positively about the law of God. But with my flesh, the law of sin. So it just tells you right there that your flesh does not want to obey God. So you've got to do something with it. Say, I'm responsible. <clears throat> now, folks, the Bible says in Galatians 6, I'll give you the scripture. Whoops. That's all right. I'll give you the scripture. I was a little bit too far to the edge. And that is, as a man sows, so shall he also. This is Galatians 6, 7, and 8, okay? So it says, if a man want to sow to the flesh, you want to give in and do something, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Now, which one would you want to sow to? So next time your flesh says, I get angry, start just telling somebody off. What do you say? No. They might deserve it, but I'm not going to do it. Say amen, somebody. Amen. So catch this. Verse, Romans 8, verse 1. Who then will deliver me? Okay. There is now no condemnation. Verse 1. To those that are in Christ Jesus, everyone say, no matter what my flesh might want to do, God will not condemn me because I know what to do with my flesh that wants to do. Lay it out at the altar. Romans 12 says to lay it down on the altar, a living sacrifice. Amen. So he goes on, he says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made, past tense, free from the law of sin and death. So you got the goods on the inside of you, but your flesh has to be subjected to it. For what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and on the count of sin, he condemned then sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, listen, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the, the spirit. Hello. Amen. Not according to the flesh, but according to the spirits. The spirit. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now look at this. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. And those who live according to the spirit the things of the spirit. Notice it's a capital S. That's Holy Spirit. For to be carnally minded or selfish minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enmity against God, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who, listen, those who are in the flesh cannot, what? Please God. Everyone say, I'm not in the flesh, but in the spirit. <laughs> How many of you ever saw yourself in the flesh? 
And you say, oh, change the channel. <laughs> Come on, laugh at yourself a little bit. Amen. If you would have seen me yesterday, ah, you would say, thank God he's been delivered from his flesh. <laughs> when you're not feeling good, you're really fleshy. It doesn't matter how, how spiritual we are. Okay. I didn't do anything wrong, though. But listen to this next part. Verse 9. But you are not in the flesh. Woo! Man, I was worried there. But in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. How many are born again? Then you're not in the flesh. Your flesh is only a tool. And it has to be tuned up, tuned in, and obedient to your spirit. Can you say amen? And in order to do that, God has to do that in your prayer. We're going to show you a mystery here coming up. Something that you've read probably a dozen times, but never seen it like this. So I got a little surprise for you. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit of soul, the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he's not of his. Okay. And if Christ be in you, your body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, say amen. He who raised up Christ from the dead will also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies there's the answer you go you lay down your body in the air and God zaps it and then and he causes it to rise up and he sticks it on you like a jacket or a coat or a sweater and says go ahead and carry it on out there but don't take your dictates from your flesh don't take the orders from what your feelings say you tell your flesh what to do you got a shovel in your hand you don't let the shovel tell you what to dig <laughs> right gee shovel what should I dig we do that with God you know gee God what do you want me to do well it's all laid out here amen are you with me I gotta sip this all right so let's see what they do this is what we should do now, I know I'm reviewing for some of you, but I'm reviewing on purpose because after this, we're going to advance our teachings into more growth. I teach by series. So a series follows the next one, follows the next one, follows the next one. Precept upon precept upon precept till you are built up and you're not missing things. See, when I was first raised as a Christian, my pastor was very, very good, but when I got out on my own, I missed some teaching. I missed some things that I needed to put the puzzle together so my walk could be stronger. Can you say amen? <clears throat> All right. Now, Romans 12, familiar, you know it. I beseech you, Paul says, remember what we've read so far. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body. So you, the spirit man, present your body, your earth suit. A living sacrifice set apart, acceptable to God, which is what's respected of you. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, examine, and demonstrate what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, what I'm about to show you is what Jesus showed his disciples when his ministry first began. I hope you get what I got out of this. You see, Jesus had a big problem. Jesus had a problem? Yeah, he had a multitude of people. Thousands of people started gathering. And he had a whole bunch of disciples who didn't know what they were doing. So one of the first things he told them is what happens in prayer. See, we talk about a lot, go and meet God first thing in the morning in prayer. That was the first part of the sermon he taught them. Now, when he taught them this, he didn't just suggest some things. He drove it home, so at home that they knew this is how their life was going to be together. 
They had to deal with thousands of people. Jesus was only going to be there for three and a half years. They're going to have to deal with all these people. So what Jesus has to teach them and to share with them has to do with the way in which they put their life together. So you ready for this mystery? Whew. Still lightheaded from yesterday, so go with me to Matthew chapter 5. This is called, lovingly, the Beatitudes. Attitudes to be, okay? And then the next one's after that, salt of the earth, light. That's the similitudes. They, they are, are similar to things. So the Beatitudes are the very unnecessary things that a disciple needs to have in order to be successful in helping others. Can you say amen? Because you're not Jesus. You have to have it together a little bit to help others. So in Matthew chapter 5, let's start with verse 1. Now this is talking about Jesus. And seeing the multitudes... He went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Now, Jesus always went off to pray. Okay? Now, here's the point I want to make. Jesus got through healing hundreds of people. There were thousands of people flogging him. So what does Jesus do? He separates himself and goes up into a mountain. Why did he do that, Pastor Kerry? Because he's going to have to instruct his disciples on what they need to do to become a success for him. Everybody ready? Listen to this. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a high mountain. When he was seated, his disciples came to him. And then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, You know the scripture. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall be inherit the earth. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Seven, blessed are the merciful, for shall, they shall obtain mercy. Eight, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see or perceive God. Nine, blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called the children or sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, blessed are the poor in spirit. What he's teaching is, notice he's not teaching the multitudes. He's teaching his disciples on a crucial thing to understand. Hey, Peter, unless you come to the end of yourself, Unless you become poor in your spirit, I can't deal with you. When you become poor in your spirit, then the kingdom becomes yours. So let's define it. As long as you're running the show, God will wait. As long as you surrender every day to God, God will take you into the future. Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, all of you disciples... Unless you come to the end of yourself, you're always going to have a problem dealing with people. Say, I got it. Didn't Jesus say, if anyone desires to come after me, let him do what? Let him deny himself. Take up your cross and follow him. First thing, that, that anything, <clears throat> listen, first problem that a Christian has is his flesh. Not even the devil. I don't think he can hear the devil. He says, his flesh is so used to doing what's wrong, we'll do what's wrong. So he tells his disciples, you've got to come to the end of your flesh, of your selfishness, and depend upon me. How many never got that out of that scripture before? Look up the word, come to the end of yourself. Okay. All right, blessed are the poor in spirit. Come to the end of yourself, depending on someone else. In this case, it's God. Then the next one is, blessed are those what? That mourn. Folks, the world will make us hard. 
People's problems will make you hard. Insults and things that are spoken against you will make you harden if you let your flesh get hardened. But it says, disciples, you need to cry. You need to weep and keep your spirit sopped. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted with God's comfort. Does it rip your heart out when you see people lost? And, and if it doesn't, I mean, I understand. But the mourning part is a repentance, a, a part of us that has to stay sopped. Because if we get hard, we'll do what Peter did in the garden. Grab the sword and headed for Malchus' head, missed and got his ear. The lesson behind that is... Preachers can use the sword of the spirit, but if they don't do it in the spirit, they will cut off the ability by insulting their congregations, their ability to hear. So blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be what? Comforted. So why were you weeping up here, Carrie? I don't know. When weeping comes on me, it's mourning. And these are not tears of sorrow, you see. Then the next one. This is what happens in prayer. First, there's a coming to the end of yourself. Second, there's a, a softening of you. Remember I said like marinade, God wants to marinate you. Make you tasty for everybody. Can you say amen? <laughs> Come on, laugh with me a little bit. Okay. Then it says, what blessed are those that are meek. What's meek? Anybody here know? Meek is, one of my best examples, is when you got brand new faucets in your bathroom. A meek person has the force of crunching that thing and smashing down that little instrument. Or somebody who's meek just uses enough strength to shut it off. So if you're a person that's meek by God, you use only what's necessary. You don't throw yourself in the works. Can you say amen? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the what? The earth. Folks, antagonistic Christianity is not right. Hello? Being antagonistic with your Christianity is not right. Because you open the door and you step into a realm where Satan lives. Even the angel of God says he brought no railing accusation against the devil. He just simply said, the Lord rebuke you. And while we handle the devil, is we don't throw ourselves and call him names and do all kinds of crazy things. We just say, the Lord Jesus Christ in me rebukes you. Get out of my way. That's all you need to say. That's all you need to say. Because you just called to record Almighty God in taking care of that situation. Can you say amen? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Meek people are not weak people. Meek people are strong people, but they use only enough to get her done. Can you say amen? Then it goes on. The next thing is, blessed are what? The peacemakers. How many know peace works better than anything else? Our job is to bring peace where there's torment. Our job is to bring the Prince of Peace. Can you say amen? So while we're in prayer, we come to the inner ourselves. We soften. We learn to be meeked. And then it says, he fills us with his peace and his love. And as we get, we go out in peace. We shall go out in peace. We shall break forth with joy. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before them. You see? So we go out equipped from our time with God in the morning. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those that make peace. And then it says, here's your reward. You read the rest of that? He says to his disciples, and remember, this is over a period of time. This is not Jesus sitting with his disciples once. 
this is Jesus driving this teaching home their entire disciple life. He'd go, Peter, do you remember what I shared with you in the beginning? Come to the end of yourself? Because, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Thomas, you're going to deny that I even rose from the dead. And I'm going to have to show you my side and my hands. Who of us will believe God and take him at his word? And if God spoke it, then he, that settles it. Can you say amen? So it goes on, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Now, blessed are those that are persecuted. They hated Jesus, didn't they? Do you know why they hated Jesus? Because everything he talked about, talked about the love of God, having a relationship with his father, everything was a threat. To a sinner. They hated Jesus because his entire life told them that what they were doing was wrong and they needed a new life, the life of Christ. Could you say amen? So it says the same thing's going to happen to you guys. You're going to go out there and you think you're, people are going to give you a hand and they're going to say, oh, we're so glad the disciples are out here. We're so glad you Christians are amongst us. Now they're going to curse your name. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to poke at you because their blindness can't see the goodness in your heart. That's why we take the time that we do and we go into the world and we preach the gospel. We keep sharing good things with people no matter what. Why? Because one day they'll get it and they'll accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then you'll understand, blessed be the peacemaker. For they be called the sons of God. And then he says, it doesn't stop right there. If you get a chance to read Hebrews chapter 11, find how many people were sawed in half, fed to the lions, killed. Paul says, many times I was thrown to different things. But he says now, blessed are you when men shall revile you, and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets that were before you. So having done all to stand, we're to do what? Stand. Stand therefore in the liberty where Christ has set us free. And don't go back to your old ways. That's what it's saying. You go ahead and you start going back to your old ways. The enemy will start bombarding you with condemnation and, and stuff. And to try to get you, you know, not to come to church and not to be in Because people just don't understand you. No, 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 no. You got it all wrong. You have one enemy. And you have one flesh part of you. You're not going to take to heaven with you. So now you're mature enough to understand you're to stand in your liberty. You're not to get entangled again in yoke of bondage. You're to walk in the spirit so you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You're to meet with God on a regular basis so he can strip you of yourself and repair you and rebuild you up. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those that are meek. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. All of this is what happens when you're in prayer. So again, I'll go over it. I have just enough time. And so I'll read the whole thing to you, and it goes like this. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And he says, look, boys, I got something to teach you. He opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall be inherit the earth. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, shall, they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are those that are pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And blessed are you when people persecute you because of that. Wow! 
So if you're a Christian and you're really, really sold out for God, let God pick your friends. <laughs> Don't you pick them. <laughs> Another thing, this is just for fun. How many here's ever had to go into an operation or a doctor or a dentist or something? Some of those people aren't saved. So you would know to pray for them before they drill on you. <laughs> Say amen, somebody. All right. So what are we to stand fast in? Liberty. Amen. Stand fast in the Lord. Well, if you got something out of that this morning, will you give the Lord a hand clap? Amen.